Zuba Skerritt, the producer of a series of video programs on postgraduate research, supervision and training. This video series has been produced simply from recordings of a residential staff development program on postgraduate supervision for women held at the Twin Waters Resort on the Sunshine Coast of Queensland in April 1992. The aim of this series is to provide supervisors and postgraduate students with resources to understand and improve postgraduate studies in their department or institution. I want to suggest to you that part of the, super, the supervisor's responsibility is to induct a person into being a researcher. And I believe that's a bigger issue than simply getting a student to write a, a thesis which will be passed by examiners. And it seems to me that inducting people into being researchers involves them in all aspects of research, including publication. And so I, for example, see it as part of my responsibility as a supervisor to also help students to understand how the publication game works and how to get into it. So there's a publication culture as well as a research culture that I think students have to be inducted into. Above and beyond that, I think there's a need for students to see how I construct a research and publication program for myself. And students often ask me, you know, how, how, how do you know where you're going? How do you keep track of where you're going? How do you generate ideas? I mean, how do you know where you're going? And so, you know, I often find myself discussing with students the intimacies of my own research program. And I feel some responsibility to my own students to not only help them see what I do, but to help them create, if you like, or to begin to create academic momentum so that when they finish their degrees, they're not just simply, oh, that's over, I can relax now, but they actually um, are, have begun a research career for themselves, or at least the research aspect of their career. About 15 years ago, there was some data collected on United States academics, and these are academics who are in universities. It might surprise you to know that 60% of the tenured faculty staff in American universities had not published even one article in a reputable refereed journal, despite the fact that the majority of those people held doctoral degrees. <laughs> now, I find that absolutely staggering. You have to realise, too, that in, in, in a lot of American universities, research is not as integral um, a part of the, op of the academic operation as what it is in our culture here. But as I look around and see, um, former CIEs which have amalgamated with universities, I see that there's a whole lot of people having to do a culture change. That they're being inducted into a research culture. Now I understand that because I came from a CIE to Queensland University where I was for 18 years before I, I, uh, I joined Griffith. And I know the transition that had to go in in my mind as I went from a, from a, a teaching institution, in fact I was teaching in mathematics, teaching institution, into uh, an educational faculty where research was important. But this figure of 60% of people without one publication, it seems to me to be staggering. And yet I can see signs of how that could occur even with individuals in our own culture. And I've been on selection committees where we have recommended the appointment of an academic staff member to a tenured position where their thesis is on the point of being submitted and it looks like it's going to be a beauty. And so we've said on the basis of that, we will appoint and recommend appointment, so we've gone ahead with that. And sometimes uh, that's the last the person ever, that's the last research the person conducts. Now in some faculties that is incomprehensible, but in others it occurs, and it occurs over and over again. And I would suggest that in many departments, in many universities, if you have a look at the highly productive people in terms of research and publication, in a department it's a fairly small percentage. Not everybody is beavering away at research. Now, I understand that some people um, would rather do teaching than research, but I think there's something wrong if you're in an academic career where, where you actually adopt academic values and you say, I, I really don't want to do any research at all. One of the things that concerns me is that when we teach our students at undergraduate and at postgraduate level, we place great store on publications, the literature in our field. 
seems to me something wrong with an academic who never wants to contribute to that same field from which they and others draw. It seems to me that's part of our professional responsibility. Well, I'm not here to harangue you, but, um, but I thought I'd have a go. Let me just give you some of the, uh, what I see as advantages of publication during candidature, and before you jump to too many conclusions, uh, I'll give you some after, some disadvantages of it. Here they are. Actually, uh, I don't have a handout, so I'm, I'm worse off than Trevor is, but you will get a copy of these transparencies uh, in the manual that comes out. The first couple are that publication during candidature conceptually integrates research, the thesis and the publication. That is, people see publication as an integral part of being a researcher. And if we're inducting people into that kind of culture, then uh, not publishing is not an option. That should be part of it. And it seems to me that if we uh, supervise our candidates, they, success, they are successful with their degrees, they may, may well find themselves without any real research momentum to continue with and without the skills to publish. Because sometimes they will leave our city and go to another university or go somewhere else and they may well be stranded. And we can't simply assume that the context to, to which they go will be one which is supportive of research and pu of pu publication and will in fact provide them with the skills which they need to begin on a publishing career. It capitalises on the training for publication during enrolment. That is not, it's not something which they, which they patch up after. Now I know full well, and it's come out clearly here, that there's a great difference from department to department. Some departments actively encourage students to publish during their theses, and for some, you don't get diverted, right? You do the thesis, right? And then you figure out whether you can get a couple of articles out of it, or maybe three or four. The third one is that Publishing during candidature gives you a lot of quality control and it helps both the supervisor and candidate. My own PhD um, was relatively unsupervised. And the point was that there was no one actually in our department who was right in the area that I wanted to work in. And yet that, that is the academic area to which I was appointed. I was appointed to the University of Queensland before I had my PhD. So the only way to pursue that was to pursue an independent line and try to get some kind of feedback um, as I proceeded. And so the way I did that was to publish articles on the way through these, these articles that I was referring to. And I, I talked that over with a couple of senior people in the department. I said, what do you think of this as a strategy? And I think to, to a person they said, we think that's a fine way to go. It's very low risk, in fact. It's low risk um, partly because one, one person said to me, look, when your thesis is presented, it will have a statement in it to the effect that you know, these are the publications um, which have contributed towards it. And it's a pretty brave examiner to turn around and say, this is unpublishable junk, given <laughs> that 70% of it has already been published in the best international journals. So he said, I think you're on a winner, and I certainly wouldn't um, be diverted for that. Well, provides access to expert reviewers' uh, comments and suggestions, and I must say that uh, although I've published a reasonable amount now, I still find reviewers' comments extraordinarily helpful. Uh, someone will say, I remember one reviewer said to me, this guy has done these kinds of things, uh, these sort of things are well done, however, he seems to be unaware of the classic work of Urmson. Well, I was. I'd never heard of this guy. Um, <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, who is Urmson? So I go up to the library, can't find anything about Urmson at all. And this, this, this guy had written a classic paper on grading, okay? So there was a guy called Graham used to be in the front desk of the library a fair bit. I got a hold of Graham and worried him to death. And he eventually, to cut a long story short, found out that this Urmson was a philosopher who died back in the 60s. And uh, well, that, that was a big advance. He looked him up in Who's Who in America or something. And I didn't even know it was working in philosophy. So I eventually tracked down this article, the most likely article, and it was called On Grading, because lots of philosophical articles had on in the front of them then. <laughs> on grading. So I got all this article on grading and sure enough here it was and it was on grading apples. Okay, and I was trying to grade students and so on. I read through this um, <laughs> I read through this article and it was very, very pertinent. Because what this person was saying is, look, these are the issues when people try to grade things qualitatively. And exactly the same mental processes and difficulties that, a, uh, that an apple sort of faces in grading apples and I suppose you know, corn and pigs and everything else are the same problems that we face when we're looking at trying to assess students' work. 
So it was actually extremely helpful. Now, I would have missed that had it not been for this reviewers. <laughs> okay. <coughs> it enables the checking of the literature review and testing of emergent theoretical analysis when the topic is someone outside the mainstream of supervisors' interests. One of the problems that we have in education is that many people begin their PhD studies and their master's degrees, they view, they, generally they do their teacher education and that takes three or four years. They often go out into schools and teach for a number of years and during that time they might complete their bachelor education degree so they have two bachelor's degrees. Then they might teach eight, ten, fifteen years, then they decide they want a master's degree or even a doctorate. So then they come back. So when they come back, they, they're not interested in plugging into our research programs for the most part. They have, they have a need to work in the area where they're employed and where their interests are. So what, what, what I'm really saying is their employment interests, they wish to become their academic interests for research. So that then raises the problem. If we only supervise if, uh, in areas where we as a faculty have expertise, then we basically reproduce ourselves and don't touch any of those other questions which are exceedingly important. Now, one way to do it is to say, oh, well, we get people who are methodologists, and so they are experts in helping people methodologically. But you need more than that. And one way to, to help people is to encourage them to take the route that I took, that is to actually test themselves as they go against the literature. And I've got some people working in areas that I know nothing about, right? Well, I say nothing about. I have a reasonable general knowledge, about as much a general knowledge as, uh, as a person in education would have, just simply from knocking about with people who talk about these things, but I don't have an up-to-date uh, picture of the literature, what the main debates are about, or anything like that. So I have to say to the students, look, when it comes to this sort of thing, you are on your own, because I do not intend to read 150 journal articles in your area, right? If that's totally your responsibility. I want to help you think with thi through things, I want to help you grapple with issues, and I want to help you this way, but I just do not have the time to become an expert in another 20 areas. And publishing on the way through is a way to actually help people test their knowledge about that. Literature review is um, a tricky one. I'm in the process of reading a, a PhD thesis at the moment. And the thing that bothers me is that the literature review is totally descriptive. I think it was Millicent used the word roadmap. Well, that's exactly what it is. It tells you all, all the things, that, but there's not a critical word in it. There's no sense of standing back and saying, look, what does all this literature mean? What is it telling me? Where are the questions that are unanswered? Where are the directions that it's moving? What are the trends over the time? And how will my study fit into this whole picture? There's none of that at all. It's just this roadmap. You know? And that's a real problem. And uh, I think if students had actually studied what literature, and there are lots of literature reviews in education. People had studied those. They tried to study. I mean, I've just finished um, acting as a referee for an article. It is a literature review on a particular issue. I just finished it on Monday. And this particular one is the same problem. It is a road map of the literature. And so my comments were, it should not be published as it is. This person ought to go and have a look at what a literature review looks like. Now, I suspect it is a chunk out of a master's thesis. I strongly suspect that what it is. That's what it is. And even for a master's thesis, there should be more than road mapping. OK, encourages objective analysis of style and structure of articles in a particular genre using existing, uh, this, uh, existing articles as models, something that Trevor referred to. It increases the likelihood of satisfactory examiner's recommendations because the public publish, uh, publishability is already proven. And there's a double payoff at the end because if you're successful, you've got a research degree plus you've got some publications. And when students are looking for positions, then having publications is extremely important. Even if they only have two or three top quality ones, that is very, very important to them. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of pursuing that line uh, where it suits, and it doesn't always suit. Some disadvantages are these. Writing articles can become diversionary with a candidate getting sidetracked from the main topic. I mean, they can actually get um, hooked on it and it's point B there, and they can simply follow that and forget about the thesis. C is a bit more difficult. It could, the article could become disparate and hard to relate back to the main theme of the thesis research. That is, if they follow too many leads, uh, then it might be the overarching theme might be harder to identify. And yet it must be identified, and when they're stitched together, they must be stitched together well, because the whole thing must read as a convincing, persuasive, scholarly whole. Okay? So there are some disadvantages, and if you sat for another 10 minutes, I guess we'd come up with some more disadvantages to it. So it's not a, an unmitigated good, 
but has to be pursued with some care. Now what I want to what I want to suggest to you is that when you have a look at thesis and journal article publishing style, I can distinguish between, say, thesis text and article text. <coughs> that article text is more likely to be acceptable in the thesis than thesis text is in an article. So in other words, we've got an asymmetry about it. Okay? So the question then arises, if this is the case, why don't we get our students to write in the style of journal articles so they have some more of those characteristics like interesting and so on, than theses commonly do. I mean, many theses are just plain boring to read, don't they? I mean, they, are, they might be comprehensive and accurate and well written, perfectly well written, no typos, all that sort of thing, but basically boring. And when you go to read them, you think, oh, you know, another 30 pages of this literature review. I mean, don't you think that? I do. And yet, it, you know, there just seems to be um, a real um, reluctance to try to in, in, inject anything that could be fascinating or interesting into the whole thing. So you get the picture that it's basically a big long process that you go through, um, like laying an egg I suppose or something and eventually the egg's there and that's it, all fully encapsulated. So what I uh, wanted you to think about anyway is that article text is unlikely to make a bad thesis, but thesis text is very likely to make a bad article, in which case writing articles and getting students to study articles is possibly not a bad thing to do. Now I'm not trying to say that all articles are interesting. One little thing I think that um, one ought to bear in mind when preparing students for publication is that early in the piece, early in the supervision state, you have a think about when discussion with the students about the relative advantage of conference papers versus uh, journal articles and the authorship issue. The authorship issue is extremely important. And, um, you know, the, there's a whole uh, lot written about it, and of course you've got the new ABCC guidelines and so on, but that authorship issue can become very, very sticky later on if it's not settled early on. Okay, now, a question often arises about a research thesis and, and a book. And one of the handouts that we had this morning, it was the one from Peggy on the back page of that, was an excellent article from Canvas Review Weekly, and since that was published, there have been another three on the same kind of topic, writing manual topics. In other words, writing a book as an academic, the kind of marketing considerations that have to be taken into account and so on. Now, generally speaking, a thesis uh, won't give rise to a very exciting book for the reasons that I've outlined earlier. They tend to be things. They uh, tend to be, you know, fairly tough going and nearly every publisher will tell you that a thesis doesn't make a good book unless it is basically rewritten. And, some, and the, that particular article more or less says, look, if you think you're going to turn your thesis into a book, forget about it, start again and write a book, but have a clear picture of who your audience is and so on. There's no point in my repeating something that you've got in print form already, but I really recommend that you read that article. Now, this is uh, another model of publication with a thesis. You do the research, you do the thesis, and no publication in between. And when you finish, then you try to publish articles out of it. And the three kinds of articles that I think are most common out of this are a research review. Many people try to uh, publish the literature review. In education, it's very important. Uh, in some other fields, it's not important at all. But there, are, there is a, a journal called Review of Educational Research. And um, a, a couple of other similar ones that carry substantial reviews, and sometimes that work can be reused in that sense and get a publication out of it, particularly if it's a critical essay review rather than a road mappy. The second one is the findings one, which actually the results uh, are more like a scientific paper. And there are other possibilities to do with methodology if the, what you've actually developed is a new twist on some uh, orthodox methodology, then there may well be an article in that as well. And 
if you don't actually publish on the way through your thesis or your candidates don't, then they ought to at least think of these possibilities so that they capitalise on the huge amount of investment of their time and your time, which has already gone into training them as researchers. Now, many students, when they finish their thesis, they actually disappear into the woodwork again. You don't see them, so actually getting them to follow through with publications is not necessarily an easy task, which is one reason why I think that um, responsibility of the supervisor might include getting them onto the publication road on the way through. And this simply illustrates the other model that we've been talking about, producing articles which then can get, this is all the stitching, it's, it's all, I know what sort of stitching you call that. When I finished my thesis, one reader said to me, some of the stitching shows. <laughs> and I would be the first to agree. Uh, but what I did was, so I gave it to a person to read, and I said, you know, this is sort of two years down the track, I, well, probably five years, before I'd actually shown anybody. And I said to this person, would you read this? This person read it and said, I think you should submit. Well, that was a bit of a shock to me because I could tell the stitching was showing. And uh, he said to me, the only thing is, I don't know why this last chapter's here and I think it should be integrated better. I didn't tell him, but actually I just chopped it out and rewrote the conclusion um, and he didn't notice. But I went to another person and said, this person's judgment, what's it like? And they said, what about? What, what's the judgment about? And I said, well, this person has advised me to submit. And they said, well, if he says submit, you submit. And this person said to me, one thing that distinguishes your thesis is that it's readable. And I put that down to being a consequence of having nearly all of it published beforehand. It had been honed for publication. And the referees were telling me that life's too short and so on. Uh, so I didn't need examiners to tell me that. Uh, so I know that some of the stitching shows and still shows. Uh, my thesis was only 240 pages long, so it wasn't actually an enormous thesis at all, and some of that was, was references and so on. So it actually be, ended up being a fairly compact thesis, and um, you know, I was quite pleased with the result. But I'd gone through the, the article route as a means to an end. Another possibility is to go through a conference paper and then turn that into an article and go to a thesis. In education anyway, the number of conference papers which never get converted into articles is really very high, very high proportion. They seem to get to a conference paper and then stop. Now certainly when you give a conference presentation, it's useful to get the audience feedback and so on, but it's also necessary to follow through and I don't believe the research uh, activity is completed until it is published somewhere. And I'm actually appalled at the amount of conference material that goes. Some of it is very, very good and people just don't get around to finishing it off as an article. And one of the reasons I think is that you can get away with lots of things in an oral presentation and even the, the paper that goes out to people can have warts and all on it and people don't really care too much because they know it's a conference paper. But when it comes to referees and an article in a good journal, there is a very critical audience and you're communicating with the leaders in your field. And so the quality has to be much higher than what it is. And I think a lot of people find the discipline of converting a conference paper into an article just too much. I think it's just too much trouble. But what they do is they also reduce uh, their own academic prospects. Now, I want to talk for the last few minutes about the actual publication process, what happens um, when uh, some of you will be very, very familiar with this and some of you might not be, but it's simply a flowchart of what happens to a manuscript for an article when it's sent into a journal. Trevor has, has already talked about the final manuscript uh, check and uh, then submitting it to the editor and the instructions for submitting to the editor are very um, precise and editors will not make um, additional copies of your paper to send it out to enough reviewers. And uh, many journals have what they call double-blind reviewing. At least the journals in education all have double-blind reviewing. And what that means is that in the article itself, in the manuscript itself, uh, any, the author's name plus any references to material which would, could identify the author must be removed from the paper, must be X'd out or something, so that it can be sent out to reviewers and the reviewers do not know uh, the author's name. Now, that's not absolutely foolproof, of, of course, because in some narrow areas there are only a couple of people working and they might be able to guess. But th vice versa, the reviewer's name is not disclosed to the author. Now, in many scientific areas, the author's name is known to the reviewers, but not vice versa. And in other fields, uh, it is completely open and, and double-blind. 
Now, we just, I'll just work way through this, and this uh, transparency or the, the, the flow chart will appear in your papers eventually. First of all, the editor screens the papers. Now, uh, editors for journals uh, differ on what their load is, um, but uh, when Sam Ball was uh, editor of the Journal of Educational Psychology, he was getting papers arriving at a rate of two or three a day. Now, that's a lot of papers, and wherever he was on a plane or wherever, he'd always have a couple of papers. He had to screen them. Now, screening them does not mean reviewing them. It means seeing whether the quality seems to be about up to scratch, seems uh, to see whether the issue is really important enough, just making sort of summary judgments on these, to see whether it's worth sending out to reviewers, and finally, to see whether it's appropriate to the journal. Now, I have read uh, editors' comments, and editors from a whole lot of fields. When I was preparing the second edition of this, uh, I read a whole, into journal uh, editors' comments, and they were from all sorts of fields, you know, law, music, sciences, health sciences, all sorts of things. And over and over again, editors were saying that between 20 and 30 percent of the manuscripts submitted to the journal are not appropriate for the journal. Now, that seems to me to be a huge proportion. And what goes wrong? Well, I think uh, choosing the journal is extremely important. And if it gets to the editor and he screens it out, or he or she screens it out, you may have wasted two months or something, right? It may have been a week, right? But it may have been a long time before it even gets screened out. And it's that time that you could do with that. I mean, you could do with the time rather than the, the editor. Now, in education, it's between 30 and 40 percent are inappropriate for the journal. Now, the easy way to check whether it's appropriate for the journal is to have a look at the last 12 months' issues and see if those kinds of things, that kind of journal publishes those kinds of articles. If you want to submit to the Journal of Educational Psychology, it had better be an empirical study because they don't go much. Regardless of what their statement of aims is, they don't go much for philosophical and conceptual articles. They go for empirical results. Similarly, if you submit to educational theory, it's got to be philosophical. They're not interested. They don't publish empirical studies. And there are some that publish all sorts of things. Um, Harvard Ed Educational Review has a completely open mind. Uh, the journal called um, Administrative Science Quarterly is the most open in terms of its editorial statement that I know. And it says something like, we wouldn't presume as editors to, do, to actually decide or to indicate what kinds of things are going to be important because that would indicate we know what the field is and we don't. We want you to send us things. But by gum, they better not be a cure, cure for insomnia. I mean, that's the sort of thing they say, right? We want it to be relevant, we want it to be cogent, we want all this sort of thing. So they have speci specific requirements in terms of the preparation of the manuscript and how interesting it's got to be, but not in terms of the content. They're wide open to content. The editor screens and says, is it appropriate to the journal? If not, rejects it. Then it gets sent to reviewers. In the social sciences, generally two reviewers. And if these, re these reviewers are asked on whether they'd recommend acceptance, or they may say that, um, they may say, well, yes, it's acceptable, but it just needs a few little things patched up on it, and they're not, they're not very big. And most, most authors would have, uh, at least in my area, would have some patching to do. Not serious, but some patching to do. Sometimes the patching uh, is small things like you've missed making a point clear early enough. I'm talking about one of, as I can think of, of my own. I didn't make a point clear enough early enough in the paper. I made it clear too late down so that the reviewers actually misread what the paper was about and that didn't get clarified till later on. Now, I knew, I knew all along what the situation was because I wrote the thing, right? But they actually didn't actually get, the, they'd actually discover what the main point was until further down. So that was easy to fix. Um, there's another situation where a, uh, a reviewer wrote comments uh, that were actually wrong. I mean, the, the reviewer had completely missed the point of what I was trying to do. So then I have to turn around and uh, there were a couple of points where I could have been clearer, so I made sure I fixed those up. But then I had to write a long letter to the editor including detailed comments to reviewer so I could educate the reviewer. Okay? And I have to review a, learn something because uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's to be published this month. But you know, everything went through, but it took, took a lot of time to actually try to convince the editor and the reviewer that this is, this is not shonky stuff. It's, it is all correct. Okay? And the, the a, um, referee has missed the point. The other referee said something like, this doesn't tell us anything much we don't already know. However, nobody takes much notice of this kind of theory in Australia at the present time. They really ought to, 
and therefore this is an important article and should be published, you know, immediately. Uh, and this point had actually picked up, it's actually seen what I was driving at, because what I was taking is some theory that was developed in the United States context, apply it to the particular issues in Australia, and say, look, in Australia, this is what this means, and this is what the effects are, and they're serious. This person said, yes, people ought to realise that. And the other person had missed the point. Sent off to reviewers, okay. Do the reviewers say no? Yes, they, they, they may say it's, it's not um, acceptable as it is. Is there anything salvageable? And many reviewers will write comments. Now, in some of the sciences, you don't get much comment back. You get a, a sheet with ticks on it, right? Some of the comments that I've got here with me run to two pages of typing. Very detailed comments. And the, the person who wrote to me about Urmson's classic paper on grading, he had written me a full page of typing, of which that was one line. And that's, that's a fair investment of a, uh, of a referee's time. It could well be um, a couple of hours just in, in creating that uh, response. And I'll usually tell you whether something's salvageable or not. If it is, then it gets returned for reworking. If both uh, referees accept and it comes down this route, and if there's a split vote, sometimes the editor will decide, or sometimes the manuscript is sent to, to a third reviewer, in which case uh, it may be accepted or it may be rejected on the basis of the third reviewer's comments. Those of you who regularly submit manuscripts know how different the referees' reactions can be. I mean, sometimes they're very positive, double positive, but for quite different reasons, or double negative for quite different reasons. And uh, so when you get a split vote, it's nothing really to um, tear your hair out about. In fact, uh, just check, one of them may in fact be wrong. My, my uh, own experience has been that referees hardly ever try to take the mickey out of you. They generally are supportive, they generally try to let you down gently and point out the real problems with the thing, rather than slam you and say, this is the biggest load of nonsense I ever read in my whole life. Worst manuscript and so on. They never say that. And usually editors will write you a fairly gentle letter saying, you know, we just we regret to advise and so on. <laughs> okay, now when the manuscript is accepted, there is an opportunity for final revisions. Um, if you're publishing in, say, United States, there is an actual copyright release form that you have to sign. It doesn't occur in Australia because when you write something, you own the copyright. But in the United States, actually, you have to transfer the copyright to the journal, in which case you lose control over it except for certain things which are referred back to you. So you have residual powers of, of um, incorporating some or all of that in a future textbook of which you're the principal or only editor and various other things like that. You can use it for lecture material. You can't um, produce it for sale, for profit, and a few other things, right? But all of this is spelled out in the copyright forms, and the, author, and the editor will let you know the publication procedures. Then it goes to copy editing, sometimes leaves the editor's office, copy editing where all sorts of things are made. You might think your manuscript is absolutely perfect. When the copy editor is finished with it, it will look quite different, right? And uh, this last article that I've just uh, read the galleys for, the, um, the editor had made some rather nice little changes in wording, which were, which were better. <laughs> little words here and there, pulled an all though out of here and put it up there and things like that. Nothing that changed the substance at all, but just little refinements that added nice touches. Uh, and then you get the galleys or the proofs back, finally, and I always try to get those back immediately, um, like 48 hours turnaround time. And one of the reasons is that some editors will have seven articles lined up for a six issue, so a six article issue, and the first six in get the Guernsey, right? Because down the line, there's a, a, a manufacturer who's got this little window in his space and he knows it on such and such a day on the 15th of May, he will get all the copy for the Australian Journal of Education or whatever, and then he knows he's got X days to print and, and, and manufacture the thing and then it's out. So if the editor doesn't have it ready, it's thin. And all the paginations and everything might have been done. So some uh, editors will actually slightly overbook and get the first six in. So I always try to make sure mine's in the first six in with return publication. That's where I'm going to stop. It's gone quarter two. And uh, thank you for your attention.